Please join us every week for a new episode of Understanding the Human Condition with Dr. James Flowers. Dr. Flowers and his most admired mentors, respected colleagues, and VIP guests will share valuable insight into underlying health causes, conditions, and issues. These in-depth yet approachable episodes are a great resource for both private individuals and industry professionals. Our esteemed host, Dr. James Flowers, is one of the most recognized and respected names in the field of chronic pain, mental health, and substance use disorders, both nationally and internationally. Dr. Flowers is the founder of J. Flowers Health Institute, located in Houston, Texas. For more information about J. Flowers Health Institute and its concierge services, go to jflowershealth.com or dial 713-783-6655. And be sure to mention this podcast. Welcome to Understanding the Human Condition with your host, Dr. James Flowers. Hey, Robin. Hey, Dr. Flowers. How are you? I'm great. Good. We're on episode 30. Three. Wow. Can you believe it? I remember it? episode one. Do you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I am so excited today to have Kristen Ager with us from Little Rock, Arkansas. Yay. Thank you. It's good to welcome. Be here. You had the choice to do it over Zoom, and you and I started chatting and with Robin, and I said, what, what if you flew in to see us? Because you and I go way back. We're good friends and colleagues, and uh, we haven't seen each other in a year since pre-COVID. And I was like, come on down. We're both vaccinated. Yeah. Robin's vaccinated. Yep. Yeah. So we're all past that. And thank you for coming down. Oh, it's my yeah. pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, glad you're here. Can I read a little bio on you? I would, would love you, it. Can I humor you with this? Mm -hmm. For those who don't know who you are, which most of our audience will, but for the mothers and fathers out there, I'd love for them to hear this. Kristen Egger is a clinical interventionist, psychotherapist, and consultant from Little Rock, Arkansas. She's been in private practice since 1992, where she provides intervention services, outpatient treatment, and case consultation locally and nationally. Intervention, ser intervention services include planning and facilitating interventions, clinic transports, and providing continuing care. Kristen is, is trained in both invitational and rehearsed models and tailors the intervention to the needs of each family. Rather than focusing solely on the patient, the emphasis is on the healing for all of the family. She's a certified intervention professional, a certified love first clinical interventionist, and a certified arise interventionist. Her clinical services include individual group and family therapy, specializing in alcohol, drug, and eating disorders, as well as illness, grief, and loss. She is a member of the Trusted Provider Network, the Network of Independent Interventionists, the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals, the National Eating Disorder Association, and is a founding board member of the Eating Disorder Coalition of Arkansas, and a member of the FBI Citizens Academy Alumni Association at the Little Rock Field Office, and a dog rescuer. Oh, that's yeah. the most important right there, the yeah. dog rescuer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What kind of dogs do you take in or rescue? I rescue senior dachshunds, oh, weenie dogs. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, and I currently, though, have a therapy dog, uh, Jet, who comes to work with me and also goes on interventions with me, and she's such a calming presence mm -hmm. for people who are anxious and nervous that mm. uh, people come in my office, and if they don't see her there, they turn around and look as if they want to cancel, and I say, do you want to reschedule mm -hmm. when Jet's back? Oh, right. Wow. So, yeah. She's you wonderful. know, I'm working on Sky trying to get her, you know, trained to become a therapy dog. She's a little she's only 8 months old. I've already spent a few thousand dollars in training. Uh, she's not quite there yet, though, so I may send her home with you. <laughs> <laughs> Run around on <laughs> the farm Arkansas. a bit. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Exactly. Yeah. That would definitely work. I know. Well, good for you. And you know my friend Nancy, mm -hmm. who you know as well. She uh, rescues dachshunds as well. And uh, mm -hmm. what is her latest dachshund? Boss. Boss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boss. Beautiful her boss. He was a show dog. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. beautiful, long-haired, mm -hmm. like just... All the way down to the floor. He is the boss. Yeah. My he dog is, is he loves him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My well. current face mask uh -huh. is, uh, trust me, I'm a dogster and it's a miniature dogster. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's, nice. That's great. How did you two meet? How do you, you know, know each other? probably, I, not probably, professionally. We probably met at a conference. We've known each other for a long time uh -huh. and we're good colleagues. And, and then we became, I hope, good friends. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are. And we've done some work together we've yeah. done some interventions together yeah consultation mm -hmm. referrals so we've had a 
a long and wonderful relationship we have in my opinion and we're really good friends that's right yeah, yeah. when i have a problem sometimes i just pick up the phone and call her and say <laughs> hey what do i do and likewise and then she tells me the truth and <laughs> <laughs> that what you want to hear doesn't make it easy <laughs> so thank you for doing that and she referred me Kristen saved my life and referred me to an amazing trauma therapist uh jill crush up in boulder colorado area and uh, so I went up to Jill and did a uh, weekend retreat for trauma therapy. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. And Kristen's was good enough to send me up there. So thank you. Aww. Yeah. We get to do things like that for each other. That's yeah. sweet. Yeah, absolutely. So your specialty is eating disorders, correct? That is true. Yes. I do a lot of different uh, areas of practice, but primarily these days it's uh, eating disorders alcohol and drug problems process addictions and then still my first love has been oncology from years and years ago when i worked here in houston at uh, md anderson on the leukemia oh. service but nice. i'm most well known for the uh, eating disorder intervention work and yeah. complex mental health and alcoholism all together yeah sometimes one and then sometimes all <laughs> Exactly. So yeah. I'm just going to ask a simple question. What is an eating disorder? For those listening, what is it? In a general way, I would say an eating disorder is an abnormal relationship with food. I think that's so true. That's, when, you, when it all rolls down to brass tacks, that's what it is. Just exactly. an abnormal relationship with food. Okay. Yeah. And what triggers it? Gosh, you know, it can be anything. Back in the old days, we thought, oh, it's the mother's fault. Everybody blamed the mother for mm -hmm. being a bad mother, which couldn't have been further from the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, we attribute eating disorders to lots of factors. Uh, trauma history uh, within the family, house fire, uh, mm -hmm. abuse. Um, from the culture itself, mm -hmm. where there is an outrageous uh, desire to be thin, thin to the pressure. extent that yep. people are, are willing to die. And, you know, an, initially we saw young girls. The, the, the profile was mm -hmm. of a young girl who makes a four point um, and uh, is smart as a whip, is a cheerleader who develops anorexia nervosa. And that has changed. Mm -hmm. there, uh, not that other illnesses related to mm -hmm. eating disorders or eating disorder diagnoses were not around, but they certainly uh, weren't as well known or as prevalent, including bulimia nervosa, uh, purging through various methods, um, and a newer one, ARFID, which is avoidant and restrictive mm -hmm. food intake disorder. Um, binge eating disorder is classified now in the DSM-5 mm -hmm. as a real diagnosis and used to uh, uh, have a different uh, name, compulsive overeating. So there, and there are other uh, food disorders, but those are the, the most common ones as well as um, orthorexia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you think that uh, Instagram, Facebook, social media, have had a huge influence on the numbers that we're seeing rise in eating disorders? I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, because we are seeing people who are presenting themselves as mm -hmm. who they really are not on social media. Mm -hmm. And when you see them in person and they may be very ill right. and they don't have on makeup or mm -hmm. they're trying to act like they're okay right. on social media, they are being portrayed as somebody perhaps that they're really not right mm -hmm. and then we are seeing all kinds of things that are eating disorder friendly mm -hmm. websites such yep. as pro anna the bimbo game mm -hmm. which yep. is about eating disorders and um, body image right. there's all kinds of stuff out I'm there oh, yeah. and I that has a huge yeah. impact and mm -hmm. not just on young girls now you know eating disorder people people who have eating disorders are all ages from young to the elderly mm -hmm. all genders mm -hmm. uh, different socioeconomic mm -hmm. um, categories and there are a lot of different factors so mm -hmm. it's not just this 
anorexia. It's not just little girls and, and little women, girls young that are women. Skinny yeah. and want to stay right. little like mm-hmm. a boy. Yeah, yeah, it's much it's much and more complicated. We're now. seeing it in gay males yes. who want to look beautiful and look handsome, and we're seeing it in trans population. Absolutely. We're seeing it really, as you said, in older geriatric population. And something you and I talked about earlier today was you're seeing a rise in baby boomers and the numbers in baby boomers of exactly. eating disorders. I wonder yeah. why. Well, it makes me wonder sometimes if it if an eating disorder was dormant Mm -hmm. for a while and has resurfaced, Mm -hmm. um, a great Mm -hmm. example regarding that would be what's happened during COVID and the Mm -hmm. inability to cope with the unknown, the fear. um, And so we're, we're seeing a a great deal of people with uh, eating disorders now who are Mm middle-aged baby boomers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, earlier we were talking about uh, nowadays seeing young ladies in all ages uh, trying to be as thin as completely possible. And then we were talking about Marilyn Monroe. I had no idea Marilyn Monroe was a size 12 or 14. Exactly. Anna Nicole Smith, the same thing probably. 14, 16 probably. Yeah. In that day, Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. beauty was in curvy, Mm -hmm. voluptuous Miss America, right? Mm-hmm. You know, back in the fifties. Yeah. Now, what we see, thin, muscular, mm-hmm. very fit, right, and mm-hmm. not curvy mm-hmm. or voluptuous. Sure. Yeah. You know, you're a licensed clinical social worker in a in a thriving private practice in Little Rock, Arkansas. And what brought you to have a, a specialty? I know you have many specialties in the addiction field, but what was it about the eating disorder specialty that really drew your attention? Were you seeing a lot in your practice and you wanted to learn more or how did that kind of unfold for you? That's a, that's <laughs> a, it's been a very interesting journey for me. Yeah. Um, I do see people with eating disorders in my practice and many people come to me almost at death's door Mm -hmm. and well into the disease process. Mm -hmm. And I began thinking about what can I do to help this population Mm -hmm. get the medical care they need sooner Mm -hmm. rather than at the end of the disease process when they perhaps have developed uh, Mm SEAN, severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. And that led me to uh, contact uh, a couple of interventionists in the country, Mm -hmm. Heather Hayes Mm -hmm. um, in Atlanta and uh, Judith Lando Mm -hmm. uh, in Colorado and Deborah and Jeff Jay Mm -hmm. in Michigan. And I decided I would train if they would let me come into their trainings uh, on how to do an intervention with people who have eating disorders because it's complicated and there are a lot of different factors that we don't think of with alcohol and drug Mm -hmm. interventions right Um, oftentimes it involves getting air ambulance to transport the person who's so gravely ill up to say denver acute Mm -hmm. the only uh, intensive care hospital for eating disorders in the country and so i've spent a lot of time with um, educating professionals through lectures around the country about when to refer somebody Uh Mm -hmm. because if somebody has an eating disorder they need to be seen by a therapist who is trained and has experience with treating Mm -hmm. eating disorders. Isn't it amazing how as mental health professionals we're trained in graduate school to (laughs) refer refer when it's outside of our outside of our box right outside of our specialty or our training area i'm certainly not an eating disorder specialist so i would refer out or use one of our providers as Mm -hmm. that expert and uh what you were talking about it we were talking about why don't people refer out why do we wait so long why do we wait until a five foot one woman or man for that matter Mm -hmm. uh, five foot ten man uh, is 94 pounds or 74 pounds, right? And talking about the need for early referrals and early intervention in the eating disorder process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to denial of the severity mm-hmm. in both 
the person with the eating disorder and their loved ones. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it's not that bad. Much like other um, addictions. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it can't be that bad. Denial is very, very strong. And when you're watching it happen, it can be gradual. Mm -hmm. Somebody with binge eating disorder, you don't notice some of the things that are occurring. And then you turn around and the person's got all kinds of medical problems, mm -hmm. uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, perhaps they are being referred for gastric bypass mm -hmm. or gastric sleeve. And so there are many situations in which people don't notice, not on purpose, but mm -hmm. do not notice or do not put together the complex picture mm -hmm. of what's happening. If I say, have you seen any evidence mm -hmm. of uh, any bulimia? Mm -hmm. It was just purging through vomiting, exercise, mm -hmm. diuretics, um, laxatives. And then they'll say, well, you know, we did see a big box of mm -hmm. laxatives or mm -hmm. uh, we just thought she was getting sick all the time after meals. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we begin to ask and, and with providers, uh, we're saying, are you trained? You mentioned the Eating Disorder Coalition of Arkansas, and we want people to be saying, I treat them, if they've been properly trained, trained because if yeah. you don't know what you're doing, you can really mess somebody up. And, yeah. and it's just like an addiction as well, yes. you know, addiction for alcoholism or addiction mm -hmm. for drugs, drugs, in that that person sitting in front of you many times probably isn't being fully truthful. Imagine oh, that. No, there's no problem here. I'm fine. I'm fine. I eat when I want to eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm healthy. Yeah. And you have and to know how to pick up on the nuances. And I do believe that it's a little odd if someone says they have a normal exercise routine. I, I run three hours on the treadmill per day. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not kidding. It's yeah. really, really true. Mm -hmm. And it's grown to that point because it takes more right. and more as the yeah. person gets sicker than sicker mm -hmm. and families get just desperate to help yeah. their loved ones and they try and do all kinds of things and so my mm -hmm. passion really uh, was born of that mm -hmm. and watching people be so sick mm -hmm. and have uh, op options opportunities to mm -hmm. get people into treatment mm -hmm. um, sooner than later. That's right. And mm -hmm. what I have discovered for myself is that my passion is to do interventions, not screaming, hollering, yelling interventions where you tell somebody everything bad, right. get in the car, we're going to treatment, but interventions wherein we prepare a family mm -hmm. to approach with love, not shame, blame, right. and guilt. And we want to switch that over to compassion, care, and hope to get not just the patient into treatment, but to help the whole family system heal because the entire family system, as with other right. uh, mm -hmm. addictive processes, everybody gets sick with this. Mm -hmm. So we want not the patient to mm -hmm. be treated and the family as well. Mm -hmm. The old days of send the person off to treatment and when they come back every thing will be just fine over and what yep. we also know is that one-on-one -on -one, you know you all know lots and lots of family mm -hmm. members who have begged somebody to get treatment right. for uh, a problem and they're not successful cry mm -hmm. holler everything but what we know is that one-on-one -on -one addiction or an eating disorder will win but together we are stronger that's right. And I, I use Heather Hayes' mm -hmm. uh, analogy about um, you've got a terrorist in your home. That's right. Mm -hmm. Your loved one is the hostage. Mm -hmm. You're the one trying to wrest your family member mm -hmm. back from the terrorist. In some cases, when I do an intervention, mm -hmm. the terrorist is alcoholism. Sometimes it's gambling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's an eating disorder, <clears throat> and you are in the fight for your life. That's right. To mm -hmm. get yeah. that person back mm -hmm. so we treat the family as well they are just as traumatized 
and intervention is a way to prepare people for treatment, both the, the person of concern and the loved ones. Here's what's going to happen. This is mm-hmm. how it goes. Mm-hmm. And then when I work with a family, um, I have them sign a contract for the work they're willing to do, including right. support groups, mm-hmm. uh-huh. therapy, and different actions so that we can bring the family back together and everybody mm-hmm. has a good shot at healing. And That's I've seen you do that work on um, interventions that you and I, that you have invited me to be a part of. <laughs> um, and we've had a great time. But the work that you do preparing and, and getting the family ready and then sitting there with the family pre-intervention and then working with the family post-intervention is just, it's a beautiful uh, unfolding of, of healing and you're amazing at what you do. Do you see uh, often that uh, eating disorders run in a family? Like a mother and daughter, father and son, mom and dad question. both? Do you Actually, see that often? I do. That there is a generational trickle down, if mm-hmm. you will, much like other illnesses. Mm-hmm. Breast cancer mm-hmm. um, and anxiety Mm -hmm. disorders and yes it is generational mom or dad or somebody has been on a perpetual diet right and Mm -hmm. kids pick up oh well this is what you're supposed to do and so i end up sometimes treating both generations Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow very true interesting do you find also that in some of these instances though you know when you have the family has to heal there are siblings that get that are overlooked because all the attention is given to the sick member, right? You are absolutely right. I know when I worked over here at uh, MD Anderson, Mm -hmm. um, all the focus would be on the patient Mm -hmm. and their siblings Mm -hmm. would literally be left out because all the attention was focused on the ill child. Yeah. And That's that's part of what we noticed. And again, we go back to everybody needs help. When you're fighting in dealing with a chronic, potentially life-threatening illness, it affects everybody. Mm-hmm. That's why we have Alateen. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why oh, we yeah. have support groups for little kids whose moms and dads and siblings mm-hmm. may have an addiction or an anxiety disorder, bipolar, mm-hmm. depression. Sure. Yeah. We have to work with everybody to help them heal. That's right. Yeah. You know, speaking of a terrorist in your home, I know this is different. But you have a special project coming up with the FBI. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear more about that. Well, I have worked with the FBI via the Citizens Academy Mm -hmm. and worked uh, with them to educate high schoolers about drug addiction. There's a national film that the uh, FBI produced in 2014 called Mm -hmm. Chasing the Dragon. And it is about seven or eight people and their real life stories of how their drug addiction Mm -hmm. developed. Some recover, some don't. And the FBI field office in Little Rock, along with state agencies uh, around uh, Little Rock and in in Mm -hmm. other parts of the state have come together to develop Chasing the Dragon documentary Arkansas. Wow. So that we have nice. families who mm-hmm. have experienced and recovered, mm-hmm. families who've lost people, and we feel very passionate about how important it is for us to do that. And certainly it starts at home. I have That's lost right. a family member myself mm-hmm. to uh, drug addiction. Yep. And we're trying to educate and help families and people deal with it. We're, it, we're better, you know, it's much better now, but gosh, yeah. it's hard to. It is. Yeah, and, and sometimes that's why people like you and I are in this field is, you know, I've lost two sisters and mm-hmm. you've lost family members and and, uh, and this gives us also that sense of purpose of giving back, right, exactly. and our passion. And right? prevention. And prevention. For other people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a what, huge piece of it. What yeah. are some other signs that you can let the audience know to pick up on of the, and these eating disorders? Well, people think about, uh, you say eating disorder first thought is usually anorexia nervosa Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a desire to be very thin and so people will see that and say oh that's an eating disorder so uh, changes in appetite changes in appearance in tolerance of cold uh, refusal to participate in meals but loves to fix them Mm -hmm. there are all kinds of things that you would see in medical problems gastro problems 
uh, neurology problems in terms of brain mm -hmm. dysfunction when the brain shrinks from absence of um, nutrition, uh, cardiac involvement. Mm -hmm. People think about Karen mm -hmm. Carpenter, the right. singer mm -hmm. who died years ago. So for anorexia, those are some of the symptoms. Okay. With uh, bulimia, you might see evidence of uh, purging through vomiting or boxes of laxatives. Mm -hmm. um, or in binge eating disorder, you might see cartons and excess food trays that are gone without explanation. Mm -hmm. And all of these, as well as the other eating disorders, are a sign of difficulty and of, mm -hmm. of of suffering. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, educating people about, there's nothing funny about it. People do make jokes, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think that people understand sometimes mm -hmm. that they are jokingly offending somebody. So right. we try to educate people and help them to understand. Yeah. You know, you know uh, I'd love to ask you a, a, what your clinical opinion of gastric bypass and sleeves are. And I have done in my practice over the last 30 years, probably thou I know thousands literally of gastric bypass pre-surgical evaluations, preparing someone, really evaluating whether they're appropriate and can follow physician rules and follow a very strict diet and, and quite frankly, not die. Right. Mm -hmm. And so before a physician approves that, sir, or before that physician will perform, they should have a pre-surgical psychological evaluation to determine appropriateness for that. And you mentioned this, so that's a good stepping stone to, to have a colleague that will say, yes, this is appropriate, no, this isn't appropriate. Mm -hmm. But you took it one step further and you know a physician and I've never seen this with any gastric bypass specialist that I've ever worked with here in Texas. And you have a, a colleague in Little Rock uh, that performs a surgery that will actually put their patients on a restricted calorie diet as mm -hmm. small as the diet they'll be eating with this after the surgery for a period of time prior to surgery mm -hmm. to make sure they can follow that diet. Exactly. And now that is much more common mm -hmm. in bariatric centers around mm -hmm. the country that they do uh, an assessment because if you're going to have that kind of surgery, are you going to be able, do you have the support, mm -hmm. do you have what you need to be able to be compliant with what's necessary for the healing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the doctor says, well, I'm going to put you on this diet, come back in six weeks. And if they have sometimes gained mm -hmm. weight, they're going to say, are you eating less? Are That's you right. eating exactly what I tell you? And it's it's a way to see, can this person be compliant? Were they not? Right. Not everybody's a good candidate mm -hmm. for yeah. that. Mm -hmm. You know, when people have tried everything else, though, mm -hmm. sometimes that's the best thing they can do. Right. But you yeah. want to make sure it's somebody who can be able to follow because it's not an easy thing to do. It is not easy. I've seen no. some great stories uh, and great outcomes in gastric bypass mm -hmm. and sleeves. And I have... You and I both have seen some just miserable outcomes in that mm -hmm. surgery. And so I just want to say, if you're considering that surgery, visit with a specialist and visit with a psychological expert that understands and a nutritionist and prepare yourself and make sure that that's appropriate because your life is drastically different when it comes to food and vitamins and, and able, you're not even able to, uh, process vitamins and, any longer and absorb. and absorb that's the word i was looking exactly. for exactly yeah yeah and you know how is that going to affect you and your family mm -hmm. your work so it has far reaching mm -hmm. um, consequences and also the body image piece of mm -hmm. that even though you've lost the weight many people say to me i still see myself as very large yeah and they may not be. In fact, some people, you know, right. have had a problem then with anorexia. But, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if if you um, have a team, I'm mm -hmm. really big on team approach. When mm -hmm. I treat people, even in my private practice, mm -hmm. we want a medical doctor, psychiatrist, absolutely have to have a dietitian who mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, eating disorder trained. Yeah, absolutely. So it takes, it's a team approach. And then the, the person, loved ones, their whole Yep. Circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because they're men in their world. You know, let's say it's a woman. Mm -hmm. She loses weight. Mm -hmm. She looks great. But what they don't realize, because I've had a few friends go through this, is that 
men start looking at their wives mm -hmm. and these husbands yeah. weren't accustomed to Do that. Do you know the last number I remember, and I'm terrible at statistics, we're not going to quote numbers today, but it's about the divorce rate after gastric bypass mm -hmm. after a year is well over 50%. It's around that. 60, yeah. 70% mm -hmm. yeah. of people get divorced after mm -hmm. that surgery, which is just wild. Yeah. Um, I had a, a, a question. Uh, I go to a, a fitness center and work out, and at the fitness center, it's the I don't care if I go at 6 a.m., 6 p.m., 3 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, 2 o'clock on a Sunday. There is a woman there that is about, if I had to guess, she's probably, she's very tall. I, she's 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 and she is either on the treadmill or on the elliptical going as fast as she can and her little bone her spine from the top bottom yeah. of her neck all the way down you can see every single notch oh. her shoulder blades her her elbows are huge her knees pop out her legs are just thin and her arms are just thin and i get so mad at the fitness facility and I don't know why I'm mad at the fitness facility, but I'm, I get yeah, pissed you know, off. Uh -huh. at the, yeah, yeah, I do. You, you know why? Yeah. Because yeah. here you've got somebody who's clearly ill and something terrible could happen mm -hmm. right in front of you. You right. know, people have heart attacks. They have yep. all kinds of problems. I literally watch for her when I'm there because if something happens while I'm there, I want to help her. Exactly. That's how bad I think it is. And I don't mm -hmm. know what to do. What would you suggest? Well, I'll tell you what I did when mm -hmm. I witnessed that at the place where mm -hmm. I work out. Mm -hmm. I spoke to the uh, manager mm -hmm. and then the owner and said, you you need to look at this. This is not just a liability for your company, which mm -hmm. to me is not the most important thing. Right. But this person is ill, mm -hmm. and if you are allowing the person to continue to work out here mm -hmm. it does not take a rocket scientist to see that he is not well. That's right. Do you think it might be a good idea to say, you know, we need for you to, mm -hmm. to stop exercising and see a doctor? Yeah. When we have approval, you can come back. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I have witnessed that, and I've seen it in some of my patients. Mm -hmm. sure. And then I have gotten calls mm -hmm. from athletic centers yeah. about yeah. this. And wow. I'll say, here's what you ought to do. Yeah. You know, to save the person's life Absolutely. because they are caught in yeah. the trap of it. They can't mm -hmm. stop. And remember, the brain stops functioning yep. mm -hmm. when you're overloading mm -hmm. it, your body or underfeeding mm -hmm. you. Either way, it doesn't function properly. That's right. Yep. I agree. I'm going to say something to the fitness center, yeah, the manager. You yeah, You could be saving her life. Yeah. Well. Exactly. Yeah. Well, no, I was going to ask her. I heard, I heard a, something about this nickname you have, Tink. Ah. <laughs> Do you want to tell us that story? Oh my gosh! Yes, I've done. That's for tell Tinkerbell. Story. Tinkerbell. I'm called the Tinkster. You mm. can thank Heather Hayes for that. Uh -huh. That's cute. Um, a number of years ago, uh, several of my colleagues, uh, Heather and a few other people, we participated in what's called a Shatterproof Challenge, and that is an event where people rappel down bank buildings. Um, to one, wipe out the stigma of addiction and provide funds to educate children about um, the dangers of drugs and mm -hmm. addiction. And so we uh, were prepared and had ourselves all ready, and we were going to high five all the <laughs> way down this 24 story building. Oh my God. And as we got prepared and they put us in the harnesses every question they asked me I would answer and my voice got higher and higher <laughs> because I was scared to death oh God, yeah. and then when they said sit back I I wasn't going to wait for Heather or anybody else and she's over there asking is this thing going to hold me are you sure you've got this plugged in and they <laughs> looked at me and did the thumbs up and I, I flew <laughs> I didn't oh, wait my for anything. God. And they said, there she goes, Tinkerbell. And so from then on, <laughs> that is I fantastic. Tink, the Tinkster. Wow. Tink yeah, the tinkster. I flew down there. I was at floor 11, and Heather hadn't even taken off yet. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Calling is a SWAT team or something Maybe, like that. You oh, you see, I am interested in that. Uh -huh. I am very <laughs> interested. The only thing I did miss is they were giving instructions that you were supposed to look up and look into the window at the 11th floor mm -hmm. but they were changing out my harness because they took your picture 
Oh. I looked like I was texting <laughs> going down <laughs> when I was really concentrating on the break. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's mm-hmm. the tinkster. Yep. That's me. I told you earlier that yep. really what she was doing is, is in her mind she was pretending she was doing an intervention, scaling down a, <laughs> a wall, go. and she was yep. going to slide into a window yep. and save someone. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. That's I love funny. it. <laughs> You know what? Uh, Let's wrap up on what advice do you have for families and friends, loved ones listening uh, to this that think maybe they have a friend or a loved one uh, with uh, an eating disorder? Well, the first thing I would say is if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. There are many organizations, IDEP, NIDA, uh, and... uh, Academy of Eating Disorders who have websites Mm -hmm. where you can ask questions, learn, take some quizzes, Mm -hmm. and get educated about how to best approach, and then certainly consult someone who has experience Mm -hmm. in treating this to see how do we approach Mm -hmm. our loved one, what can we do, and those of us who do this are I am always open. People can call me any time to ask me, does this seem like a real eating disorder? Mm-hmm. What do I need to do? So educate yourself. You can do so in a free uh, venue via websites. Learn about it. Get some advice mm-hmm. from a professional who knows this, who can guide you mm-hmm. to get in with the medical community, begin to look at what level of mm-hmm. care If you need outpatient counseling all the way up through um, uh, inpatient Mm -hmm. and intensive care. So that's, I think, there is help out there. And Mm -hmm. when I hear people say, well, I guess I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life, my blood just boils. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. Are there some people who don't recover? Mm -hmm. Recover? Yes. But there are many, many people who do, and you would never have known it. That's right. Act early. Don't keep the secret. Yeah, absolutely. That, that would be, ask yeah. for help. Yeah. You can call me anytime. How do people call you? You call my phone number, which right. is 501-258-5393. And although and, I'm sure you can't tell it by my accent, I am in Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> and she works all over the United States, really international, yeah. but mostly the United yeah. States. And uh, do you have a website? I do not. I love it. That's fantastic. <laughs> How about your email? If they want to email uh, you? Kristen mm-hmm. at kristenager.com. And that's A-G-A-R. Correct. A-G-A-R. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love it that you were here and that you took time out of your busy yes. schedule to come spend time. And you, you came to J Flowers Health Institute and did yes. a little tour. Yes. We got to go to dinner last night and spend some time together. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I can't wait to see you for Caitlin's wedding uh, in Austin. Three weeks. That's right. Well, thank Aww. you so much thank for having you. me. Thank you. Yeah. Great to meet you in yeah. person finally. Thank you. And Dr. Flowers, if they want to reach you, how do they do that? Go to our website, jflowershealth.com, and there's a contact us button right there. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.